I would like to acknowledge that we are meeting today on the traditional territories of the Indigenous people across Turtle Island. We thank them for allowing us to meet and learn together on their territories. To the original caretakers of this land, of which we stand, I acknowledge the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, where I am right now. To all that was here for thousands of years before us across Turtle Island, we honor the struggles and the lives of those who gave themselves for it. For all those here today, we acknowledge the ancestors beneath our feet and the land on which we stand. With our ears to the ground, we can hear them. The Cree Nation, the Métis, the Diné, the Anishinaabe, the Dakota and the Lakota Nations, the Inuit, the Blackfoot, the Innu, and all of the nations that came before us and those yet to become. An infinity of footsteps of those who long called this land home. The unfolding of bundles, the undoing of colonization, and the opening of this land to allow treaty to come alive. We affirm our relationship to each other and to the land. We acknowledge and pay respects to the Indigenous nations and ancestors of this land. Once again, I acknowledge the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples where I am right now. The artwork that you see on this slide is by Indigenous artist, Chief Ladybird and Aura Lass. It depicts the two row wampum belt and the Dish with One Spoon Treaty of which as a treaty person residing within this ancestral land, I am beholden to. So I'd like to thank everyone again for joining us today. I'm excited for this webinar, not only because we have some amazing speakers for you today, but also because mental health affects us all. And over the past year, we have seen in our personal and professional lives how COVID-19 has brought to light many of the ways in which as a society we can do better. I've had the honor of meeting with our panel prior to day, today and got a taste of what they'll be presenting to us. So without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Stephanie Mayo. Stephanie Mayo is a project coordinator with TNO's Empowering Migrant Workers in Ontario project and a PhD candidate in the Medical Anthropology program at the University of Toronto, where her research investigates the ways employment under Canada's Seasonal Agricultural Worker Program influences the health and well-being of Jamaican agricultural workers. In 2016, she completed her master's degree in the anthropology of health, and her thesis investigated Jamaican agricultural workers' experiences of stress and resilience while working and living in so Southern Ontario. Stephanie has been conducting community-based research with migrant agri agricultural workers in Ontario and Jamaica since 2014, primarily connecting workers with social supports and assisting injured workers navigate healthcare and the workers' compensation system. Stephanie is also a member of the Migrant Worker Health Expert Working Group, a team of academics and clinicians who came together to address the needs of migrant workers in Canadian agriculture during the COVID-19 pandemic and to provide evidence-based guidance to both federal and provincial government agencies. Um, so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so that Stephanie will be able to share hers as she has some slides prepared for us today. So thank you for joining us, Stephanie. Thanks very much, Jalen, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much to Kairos as well for inviting me here to speak to with you all today about um, mental health among migrant agricultural workers in Canada and the ways in which COVID-19 pandemic has um, impacted an already um, you know, concerning situation. And so today I am going to talk a little bit about um, migrant agricultural workers' experiences of mental health here in Canada the ways that COVID has impacted these experiences, as well as the kinds of supports and services in Canada that can help foster resilience. And so as Jalen mentioned, I'm an anthropologist, a medical anthropologist. And so approaching mental health, um, I'm looking at the social determinants of health. Um, and my colleague, Janet McLaughlin, did some research back in 2009 and 2010, um, so quite some time ago, around the ways in which um, working here in Canada influences the mental health of, of SOP workers generally, um, and, and identified a number of determinants. So employment and working conditions, income and social status, social support and connectedness, environment and housing, access to healthcare and health literacy, as well as gender issues are all things that uh, are social determinants of workers' health in Canada and mental health especially. 
And so a few factors were identified that contribute generally to poor mental health among seasonal agricultural workers, but also those on the two-year program. Um, and just generally speaking, missing and worrying about family and, and what's happening at home, isolation in a foreign cultural and linguistic environment, uh, powerlessness and vulnerability, tension with employers or community members or with coworkers and roommates, injury and illness especially, um, cramped and restricted housing conditions, stressful and unsafe work conditions, food insecurity, concerns over nutrition and weight loss, lack of sleep and insomnia, as well as in, in many regions, concerns over bicycle safety and a pervasive fear of being in an accident. And so in 2008, a group of researchers investigated um, the mental health of workers from Mexico here in Canada. And, uh, and they discovered that workers from Mexico experience nerves. That is um, a local illness category or an idiom of distress in association with their participation in the SOP. Um, and the symptoms of nerves that they experience here are bad mood, anger, sometimes rage at themselves or others. Um, desperation, lack of concentration, and the lack of coordination, sometimes sweating, difficulty sleeping, fatigue, trembling, pain. But all of these things, despite their, you know, having resemblance to anxiety or mood disorders that we understand here in North America, uh, in Mexico, these symptoms have not been medicalized um, as, a, as a, an illness. And so instead, workers experience, um, you know, they kind of embody these things here. And so in 2015, um, I conducted masters of my master's research around Southern Ontario, primarily in three regions there on the map, Haldeman, Norfolk, Niagara, and Durham region. Um, and I did a combination of interviews and participant observation uh, in a variety of different contexts, especially healthcare environments and working with injured workers. And my objectives were to understand how Jamaican workers experience mental health in association with their seasonal employment, um, and especially to uncover their common idiom of distress uh, that they use, and also to learn how workers cope with psychological distress and understand variation in mental health outcomes, and especially as a practical function of my research efforts to understand how workers are differently supported in different regions, um, which is important because workers often come into regions that they they're not familiar with, or they can be transferred between regions within the same season. And so, uh, you know, it's important to understand the ways pattern of support play out. Um, and just an idiom of distress uh, is it's a medical anthropology term and a psychology term, but it's used um, to direct attention to the socially and culturally mediated ways of experiencing and expressing distress. Um, and the reason that I focused on that was because um, the term mental health was not appropriate in my research activities among my, my research participants or my worker friends. Um, mental health has a stigma with it as a concept. Um, and, and instead, it wasn't a good starting point for discussion because of different cultural meanings and associations that play out. Um, so instead, workers talked a lot about the stress or the pressure that they feel here in Canada. Um, and, after talking to quite a number of workers, uh, I categorized the feedback into five categories of common stressors. And this is not in the order of their severity. In fact, I would say five would be um, of the most intense. Um, but the first thing was family, um, worrying about family back home when you're here. Also, and not just worrying about family, but trying to respond to your family your, your family's needs or your responsibility as a parent or as a spouse transnationally when you're distanced for prolonged periods of time creates its own package of stresses. Um, and then experiencing that kind of stress and worry while you're living and working in environments that themselves create stress um, and concern and pressures around um, work environments, around notions of powerlessness or perhaps not feeling safe, uh, living conditions perhaps uncrowded or overcrowded and um, you know not the way that workers are accustomed to living back home. Um, it's notable that workers come from homes and when they come into bunk houses, they experience that as less than what they have at home. Um, also racism and lack of social connectedness here. Um, and that, that again is patterned by region, but is a general systemic concern. Um, many times workers can return to the same communities for decades 
work very, very hard for the same employer, and yet outside of that work environment, know no one or are not connected into broader networks, be it churches or community supports. Um, and that feeling of isolation, as I'll get to, was made especially worse during COVID. Um, and I would say injury and illness would be the, the, the one main stressor that among my interlocutors and my, my worker friends, we could start having discussions around mental health and depression. Um, because when workers are injured, it creates a whole other, and ill, it creates a whole other set of stressful instances um, around how to navigate accessing healthcare and how to prevent being sent home and how to be sure that you're able to access the care and support that you need to make a full recovery before thinking about getting back to work. So those are the five main categories that I uncovered. And so one of my friends, Clayton, and that is a pseudonym, um, kind of described the ways that his injury made him feel. And he said, I'm here now, depressed and distressed. One side of my body is not working right since I got the lick. The lick he's referring to is a 2,500 pound metal bin full of wet tobacco leaves that when the hydraulic broke while um, unloading it, it fell on top of him um, and crushed him. And so he says, a few months later, when he called me from Jamaica, he said, my kids go to bed without enough food. I'm stressed out and I can't sleep because I'm worried about my kids while the WSIB people are sitting back in their chairs saying, okay, that's just another black guy. He can go away and die. And then he said to me, I left Jamaica as a worker, but I came home as a patient. Injured workers are those guys who suffer a lot. Now I can't feed my children and nobody cares. What kind of a system is this? This is a slavery system that breaks bodies. And so although I had entered the field um, expecting to find um, pervasive levels of distress among Jamaican and Caribbean workers, I did not find that to be the case. I found that the social determinants of mental health that they, that they are faced with while living um, and working here in Canada um, create variations in mental health outcomes. And so among my specific uh, research friends uh, that, who were from Jamaica, they had a, a real strong sense of resilience, which was expressed as a positive affect or, or you know, a positive disposition. And when I really probed that, it was around their sense of pride as Jamaicans, their history in the program, because Jamaicans were the first to come up to work this program in Canada in 1966. And they also associated with a deep personal spirituality and religious dedication as well as a sense of community connectedness, not just to family members, but to communities back home. Um, and oftentimes when I probed a little deeper about how they, they understood this, this sense of strength that they feel to be inherent, where did this come from? Um, and a lot of times my worker friends talk to me about um, their ancestors and the, the histories of plantation slavery that in fact, um, you know, in their, in their experiences were reference points to make themselves understand their strength. Um, now, the resilience that I witnessed uh, was not so dominant when workers became sick or injured. Um, and so social supports were the other buffering variable that really helped maintain workers' um, mental health. And the availability of social supports across Ontario varies by region. This is a province that receives a ton of workers um, each year, but it depends where workers go in terms of how they can be connected. Um, and I would say in each region where there are these support networks, rural churches are real leaders in providing those kinds of support and working with service providers. Um, and service support networks aim to provide the ongoing services that workers need through health fairs, as well as recreational events and just general social activities. And these kinds of activities are absolutely essential when a worker becomes sick or injured and they need connections here in uh, Canada to help navigate certain things like health care. And so migrant worker support networks are all over the country um, in, to varying degrees and depending by the province. But during my master's research in 2016 and sort of even in the past eight years, I would say that um, a few organizations really stand out in terms of the work that they do on the ground in different areas. Um, the Anglican Church of Canada, as well as other church denominations. Um, I think this is from my, my master's research. But um, 
one of the good things is that these groups are a like a collective of different stakeholders um, and each of them brings something different and sometimes it'll be healthcare services or health promotion other times it'll be spiritual supports um, other times it's it's a celebration or a recreational event um, and so there's lots of ways that service providers on their own or in collaboration can come together to meet the mental health needs of workers in the area and especially churches, even pre-COVID, um, you know, that was one of the things when I asked my friends, you know, what keeps you able to, you know, manage your stress while you're here in Canada? And as an individual coping skill, listening to music and connecting with family back home, but on a broader um, level, it was churches and church involvement, um, the ability to be connected with a group um, and to have someone care for you um, repeatedly as you come and go from Canada. And so uh, another friend of mine said, you know, when the pastor comes to have a prayer meeting with us at the bunkhouse, that helps us a lot. We are God believing people in the evening. We can call home and say, we want you to pray for me when you go to church. And the pastor from that church can give a prayer or something because we are under a lot of stress in Canada. It's hard if you don't have any support from anybody. And so just to bring this to COVID, um, so it, that is the broader context of mental health among workers here in Canada and the ways in which um, their, their mental health and their psychological health is impacted by their work here and the social determinants of their time in Canada. Um, but COVID really has exacerbated these factors, especially isolation. Um, and last year we saw many workers were not able to leave their farms to source the items that they need to live you know, a healthy and dignified life. Um, and there's also increased worries at the individual level about not just the, your personal health or workers' personal health, but the health of family members back home. The inability to source necessary items, um, I mean, that's, that's a concern, especially in the context of food. Um, and I would also say many of my worker friends who are Jamaican, they, they send home items usually through the year that get their families going and keep them supported. And, and that wasn't possible for the most part last year. And many of the public health protocols um, actually place the burden on workers. Um, and I'm just thinking about even this year when we look at some of the, the test kits that workers are asked to, to test themselves in quarantine and arrange for that. Um, and also, uh, you know, there is a need for health professionals to monitor workers' health and answer their questions during quarantine because workers are really stressed out and confused this year in these first two weeks. Um, and I think, you know, a dedicated health professional has been identified by many of my friends as something that they would really like to see. Um, and I think importantly, and this is like something that gets lost in various discourses, but in Canada, coming to Canada to work, migrant workers are at risk. Um, but they are widely perceived to be a risk. Uh, and in that case, there's justifications for you know, restrictions on movements and other things. But um, workers themselves are at risk. And three migrant agricultural workers passed away due to COVID last year. Um, and so we're just wanting to think a little bit about you know, xenophobia and, and racism that might inform that kind of a, a dialogue. And then just to conclude, how might we improve the mental health of workers during COVID especially? Um, and there's a few ways that service providers and community partners can do that. Um, developing accessible and culturally sensitive mental health supports for workers. It's not so straightforward as connecting workers with existing mental health services in our province and country, which are already overburdened, I think, but they're, they're just not as culturally sensible, sensitive or accessible as workers would need in order to be benefited by them. Um, but also increasing access to health care and social supports would have a tremendous um, beneficial effect on workers' mental health, as well as some form of a dedicated mobile team of professionals to monitor workers and answer their questions um, during COVID. And um, a providing a health advocate would be really helpful for workers who are sick and injured, um, you know, and, and to help them navigate health care in Canada, provincial health care, but, but other things associated with follow-up care and that kinds of thing, workers' compensation. Um, and I think workers really could use an increased access to leisure activities, but, but with safe spaces in communities where they can relax and engage in leisure in, leisure in a safe way. Um, and then on the more macro level of structures, we might think about providing the same jobs, job rights and protections to all workers as Canadians. Um, reconsidering the closed work permits that tie workers to an individual employer, which itself causes uh, a lot of stress around powerlessness as well as an absolute end to the practice of medical repatriation. Unfortunately, it is commonplace workers are sent home when they're sick or injured without the care that they uh, need and deserve. And I think that is something that workers are aware of and it causes a lot of stress. And so those are my general recommendations and conclusions around how we might come around to 
address uh, workers' mental health needs during COVID. And so thank you all very much for this opportunity. And uh, if you have any questions around it that you'd like to email, there's my email, as well as here's the bibliography for that. Thank you, Stephanie. And there will also be the question and answer period as well um, to ask Stephanie any of those questions you might have. So I will continue sharing my screen and we will move on to our next presenter. So it is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Alicio A. Martel. Alicio trained as a physician and a pediatrician in El Salvador and completed a master's in public health and public administration from the Netherlands and Costa Rica. He's been involved in the development and implementation of programs and services for diverse populations in Canada for over 20 years, and since 2017 has been working as a health promoter and a community developer for the Seasonal Agricultural Workers Program from Grand River Community Health Center in Brantford. In that position, he implemented a survey on psychological distress with migrant workers in 2017, 2018, and 2019, and the results have been presented in two Ontario educational events addressing the mental health of migrant seasonal agricultural workers. Currently, he's providing support to the Kairos Project in Linden and is part of the group working with Caribbean workers. Thank you for joining us today, Lissi. So uh, I find this a, a very good opportunity to share information that we have, but also our experience in working with the uh, uh, migrant agricultural workers. And, and it's a very special population, not only because their condition, but also because all the issues that they bring with them. And something that I would like to mention from the very beginning is that people coming from those countries into, within this program, the seasonal agricultural program, we need to acknowledge that they bring not only themselves, but also they bring a lot of resilience with them. And so uh, what we did in, with the community health center is that we decided to uh, address mental health, but we felt that we need to learn a little bit more about their conditions and uh, ailments, et cetera, in the area of, in the area of mental health to, to then to decide what to do, how to provide some support to them in that area. So uh, Jalin, can we go to slide eight? because the first slide is a little bit of repetition of what uh, Stephanie just mentioned or a little bit of amplification of what she said. Anyway, so uh, in regard to mental health, as you see, it really has two components. One is the individual element and the other one is the social element and both complement each other. So individual, they bring the ability to manage one's uh, thoughts, emotions, behaviors, and social, social interaction with others. But also there are social, cultural, economic, political, and environmental factors that also uh, incide and affect the mental health. And here we are talking about policies, social protection, living standards, working conditions, and also community social support. Next. Now, when you look at risk factor for mental health, what the list that you see here is very, very similar to what Stephanie mentioned. No? And something that also happens, if you look at number nine, is the patterns of mobility. Is that many, many workers come one year to one farm and then they don't know if they are going to come back to the fall to the next farm the following year. So some of them just go from farm to farm and that creates a lot of uncertainty for in every year in regard to what they are going to do with whom and also the nature of the farm where they will be working. Next. Now, in regard to social, the, uh, our workers, they have many stressor, stressing factors, stressor factors. And you see them, it's away from home and family, social isolation, and limited social support, language and cultural barriers, hours and working conditions, housing conditions, and limited time and opportunity for leisure and social activities. And mental health in particular is, can be quite difficult to identify, treat, and overcome in the Canadian conditions. Next. Then, as uh, Stephanie mentioned, I'm just signing here, here is that as you see, the stressors, et cetera, are very similar to the list that I listed before. So thank you, and let's move to the next one. 
Okay, so in 2017, uh, the center decided to implement a survey on psych psychological distress with the, with the workers. So from 2017 to 2019, we surveyed a total of 333 workers. From this, these workers, five, 152 were from the Caribbean and 181 from Mexico, were, were Mexicans. Now, the survey called K6 is six questions that ask subjects to rate how often they felt over the past month on in regard to nervous, hopeless, restless or fidgety, so depressed that nothing could cheer you up, quite everything was an effort, and finally, sense of worthless. Next. And then the, the survey then ranks the, the, the people who got to the survey at six levels of uh, psychological distress. And the first one is no psychological distress. The second one is low psychological distress. The third one is moderate psychological distress. Then the, the next one is high psychological distress. And the fifth one is very high psychological distress. So let's move to the next one, please. Okay. So then with the all these works, what we found based on the survey was what you see in the graph. Now, I want to mention something before you start trying to understand this. Something that we need to acknowledge is that workers are coming from, many of them are coming from very dire circumstances in their own home country. And so they live a live of stress over there when they come to Canada to work here. Now, the stressors in, the, in their native country can be a little bit different than the ones here. And so what could be very stressing for a born Canadian person can be not necessarily distressing for a non-born Canadian person. And something that I would like to share with you was that in my first years here in Canada, I remember working in a public health uh, department. And at the meetings, uh, staff meetings, I noticed that people kept talking about stress, feeling stress, I'm stressed, uh, et cetera. And I was thinking, why are they feeling stressed? The only reason they are feeling stressed is because they are changing program and they don't know what they are going to be doing in the next two years. I come from a country that what the stress you is, if you don't know, you are going to get killed the next day. So to me, those, then the circumstances were so abysmally different that I tend to kind of not take very seriously the stress of the born Canadian people. However, something that I learned later is that even though the stressing factors can be different, the results can be similar. And so the stress for born Canadian people in Canadian conditions due to Canadian factors is as real as the stress of people living in much more stressing, dire conditions. But then what happened with the workers? They come with a goal and a mission, and they see it like this. They come to Canada to earn money, to work, and earn the money that will assist them to respond to their family, social, educational needs in their home country for themselves and for their families. So they come with this mission, and when they find difficulties and challenges, it's just one more challenge in my life, but I'm still working. I'm still earning the money that my family needs. And that situation then levels all these stressing factors that they go through. And so when you see this uh, graph, and the Mexicans are the ones like a look more like orange and the Jamaicans and Caribbean are more like a dark orange, let's say so. And you will see that the 
numbers or the proportions of uh, workers with no stress is quite, let's say, close to 20%. And then most of them are grouped in the group of the seven to 13 that is low psycholog psychological distress. And when you look then at moderate, then you see that it's very similar to the no psychological distress. And when you go to high psychological distress is, I will say, very low, is less than 10%. And very high, it was very, very, the numbers were really, really low. So now, this study doesn't say that Jamaicans and Caribbeans are like this. This study and this graph reflects what we found with this group. So if we were looking for a bigger population, there is a possibility that the nature of the graph will be different. But in this sample that we uh, interviewed, that we surveyed, this is what we found. And something that also is interesting is that the differences between the Caribbean and the Mexican workers was not really significant. It was kind of similar. So can you go the next, please? There was something that we also did during the interview was asking them, why do you think you feel the way you feel? And we were able to group their comments in six areas. One area is, was not, not working on financial. The second, farmers' behavior and attitude and work demands. Then the third one is being away from family plus family problems. The fourth one is situation with coworkers. Then we have health issues and house conditions. So can we go to the next please? So, and here is the list, the number of uh, comments. So we were able to register to record 476 comments from them. And from this, as you see, the not enough working hours and less income was 10% 10, 10 of the workers, of the comments coming from the workers. In regard to the farmers' attitude and work demands was 36%. The in-house conditions was very low, 1%. Situation with co-workers were I will say also low, 5.5%. 5, 5, 5%. Health issues goes high, 24%. Family issues also goes high with 21%. Then related to the communities, uh, barely 2%. Now, what is interesting is that housing conditions has been very difficult for a long time. But for the worker, it's just a place to go, sleep, and then the next day, wake up, take a shower, lunch, uh, breakfast, go to work. So it's not a place like our houses in which we socialize, we invite, we do work, etc. So for them, it's just a moment of resting between lab labor days. So, but, with the COVID-19, housing conditions became one of the main factors in developing outbreaks of COVID-19 in the farms. And then we realized that the housing conditions, even though the workers won't be complaining too much about for Canadian standards in many places are a shame and should be modified. Now, the other issue is that the first Word that you see, not enough working hours. That has to do before COVID 19, many times with the weather. And they come here to work. If they don't work, they don't earn any money. So sometimes the weather didn't let them to work, or the crops were growing not at the time that we were, were supposed to be growing. And so they didn't have to work. So for them, then, these hours, days without working imply less earnings and less money to help their families at their own country. 
But so if we put together the working hours and less income with the farmer attitude and board demands, you will see that then those two areas that are really work related covers almost 50% of all the comments. And then what we have is the next one is the family issues. And as Stephanie mentioned, they really care and fear sometimes about their families. And not just about the negative things that can happen to their families, but also the fact that they are not there when there are baptisms, birthdays, weddings, etc., or births. Yeah, my daughter is having a baby tomorrow and I can I can go. I can't be there. And those see that situation impacts in their lives I and mean, in the field of stress here. The health issue has two elements. One is their health per se. They don't want to feel sick because nobody wants to feel sick, but also because the health condition can determine the working time, but also the possibility that they can be sent back to their home country. So then for them, health is a threat at these three levels. Can we, next please. Now, something that we did was try to identify by the topics, the proportion of comments in regard to levels of distress. And what you will see here is when you look at, at the three level, the low distress, the moderate, and I, we put together the high, the high and very high because the low number, but because these are proportions, what you will see is that the work demands, that is the second one, is the highest in this graph, graphic. It's the second dark orange that you see. Then work demands, that is the next one. Oh, yes. Then let me see. Then uh, health issues, that is the kind of brownish, and is the second last is also relatively high and family issues is also relatively high. And what you will see is that the pattern is the same with every level of distress. So for low distress, moderate and high, the proportion of boards that they have depending on the reason is kind of the same. And maybe the difference between high and moderate will be how serious is this condition, or if they are able to uh, deal with the demands that the work and the family is putting on them. Can we continue, please? So then the comments provided by workers identify three main issues. One is farmer's demands, attitude, and work demands. And farmers demand an attitude has to do sometimes with the, what they say, the way the farmer is, the boss is demanding, he doesn't understand, arbitrary. Sometimes he comes with some orientation and two days later he comes with something different. We never know what he's going to tell us today, that kind of situation. And they learn the difference between farmers in regard to uh, different owners. Sometimes. At the, in the same season, they are exposed to two different management from the farmers, and they are different. That also sometimes can be uh, a different in regard to demands at the work level. Then the second one is health issues, and the third one is family issues. Now, what is interesting is that it's my understanding that for Mexican workers, they need to have a family to, to apply to the program. With the Caribbean, not necessarily, but the still the family issues is the same for both. It doesn't matter if they don't have a direct responsibility, they still worry and care about their families from here. Next one, please. So then with COVID-19, what we see happening is that the elements that becomes a risk factor for mental health just become accentuated during this past season. And this is based 
in the conversation that we had with workers last year, 2020. Uh, so one was, and this was really high, is the high level of uncertainty in regard to what was going to happen to them and to their work. They come and they get into quarantine. And then after the quarantine, some of them get symptoms and then do continue isolated. And so, but also they go back to the farm and then in the bunkhouse where they are, there is one more positive case. And then the whole group goes to quarantine again. And they kept thinking and asking, what will happen with us? Are we going to have some income during quarantine? Are we going to have the same income after the quarantine, et cetera? And that level of uncertainty was a big stressing factor in their lives last year. The other situation was that COVID-19, because it's a pandemic, is not just in Canada, but also in their home country, there is COVID-19. And they were worrying about what was happening with them. Are they going to get sick in regard to COVID-19? Uh, but also on top of that, the, the health of their family, not only about COVID-19 related, but other issues in regard to, to health. Then, the level of isolation that is per se high for many workers in Canada when they come to the program became even higher with COVID-19. There were farms that didn't let workers to leave the farm. And some farms, they organized the uh, leaving workers to, the shop, to do shopping, they organized and they controlled it. And it was just the bus, to the town, shopping, back. So the time to socialize and to mingle and to see the town, the city, etc., is not there anymore. So isolation was multiplied during that period. Then the third one is the housing conditions. Before, they were not okay, but they say, okay, it's just during the night. But when they realized that housing conditions is one of the main factors in getting sick and getting the virus, then the housing condition becomes a big stressing factor with them. And probably that something is happening right now. Of course, all these things also increase the fear of repatriation. So what happens if I'm in quarantine and get into another quarantine? I'm going to stay here or I'm going to leave? What happens if I start with symptoms? Will my boss send me back to Mexico, to Jamaica, to Trinidad? So that kind of questioning, that is again stress. And for some who are able to see, to go to the towns, et cetera, the social discrimination and harassment. As Stephanie mentioned, many in the community saw them, saw the workers not at risk, but rather as a risk for the virus. And so there were places in which they didn't want to, to have this, the workers visiting them. And also comments talking about that they are bringing the the virus, don't let them come here to the town, etc. And of course, everybody on the farm is going through this situation and that increases the levels of stress within the farm with co-workers. But also we need to, we need not to forget that workers and farmers are part of this dichotomy. And if the farmer is also stressed because the situation that the virus is creating for his or her business, that will impact also his behavior and demands on the workers. And so here we have then this uh, mutual stress conditions in which the one who exercise more control then tend to lull even more stress on the other group. And finally, the COVID pandemic factors in their own country. Can you go to the next one, please? Ahora, we know all this, so they need service. They need to address the issue. However, there are barriers to, the, to, to providing services to them. One is the mental health stigma that Stephanie already mentioned. The other one is concerns of losing pay work time. If I talk about my symptoms, lack of transportation, the, work, the uh, health workers don't go to the farm. They need to go to the, to the health worker lack of knowledge on mental health services, cultural and language barriers, 
and lack of mental care available and accessible because both can be quite different. There is availability, but they are not accessible because they don't speak Spanish. So then it doesn't matter. Next one, please. And I believe this is the last one. And what we talk about is just strategies to address the mental health of workers. One is to provide referrals to mental health services, provision of transportation, developing and providing cultural sensitive mental health resources, implementing culturally and linguistically health education and outreach, clinical settings during farm visits, social settings and others. And I see here a role for, for example, the Cairo Center in Cinco. That can be a place in which the workers come and get information in regard to mental health. Then collaborating with other agencies serving uh, the workers, implementing mental health services delivered during the evenings and weekend hours, train clinic staff of, on workers' culturally rooted conceptions around and culturally sensitive approaches to mental health. Health workers need to learn more about this. And the last one and to me is as good as probably three of them, we need to find ways of addressing the working and living conditions of the farmers. Because the main stress in normal times come from there. Okay, so this is my presentation, thank you. And even though I didn't uh, list my, my email address, I will send it to Jalin, Yal so then you can send any question if necessary or if you are, want to learn more about this. Okay, so thank you again. And thank you to Kairos for this opportunity. Yes. Thank you, Isaiah. That was wonderful. Okay, everyone. So it's 1.57 now. I'll just give just a few more moments for folks to come back. Um, but once we do, I'd like to invite Connie to introduce our next speaker. So Connie can maybe begin in a moment. Um, thank you very much, Jalen, and also thank you very much, Stephanie and Eliseo, for your great presentations. Uh, I learned a lot, and I hope that everyone else, you know, uh, in the webinar today are, are, uh, are appreciative and learning from, you know, your presentations. Um, our next speaker is, is um, special. Uh, she has joined us in the previous two webinars and kind of just a silent, you know, participant. But the last webinar, she's, she spoke up uh, on the chat. And I would like to introduce uh, Filena, uh, Filena Pereira. Uh, she is a migrant worker in the Norfolk uh, Haldeman County. And I also would like to, to, to recognize uh, that Brett, is with us this afternoon. Uh, Brett Schuller is uh, the owner of the farm that Felina is uh, is uh, working, and and so um, I'd like you know to call on Felina to share uh, your experience and and thoughts around um, how mental health or how COVID nineteen is affecting the mental health of migrant workers. Thank you so much, Felina. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Felina Pereira, and I'm a migrant farm worker from Trinidad and Tobago. I've been coming to Canada uh, eight years now. I started in 2013. And this year with COVID-19, it's been a really stressful year for me having to come to Canada. It all started back in March 2020. Uh, it was... Uh, on my mind, wondering if I'll be able to come to Canada to work, to be able to provide for my family back in Trinidad. The stress started and anxiety started uh, with wondering if we would get flights out to Trinidad. Uh, there, there was the fear of coming on the airplane, wearing a mask, the fear of contracting COVID. And then after, after being able to come here in, Ju in July, it was a next, the next stress of being in quarantine for two weeks. It played, uh, it played, it was, it was something dawning on me, like just being in quarantine, being in a, in, I didn't stay in a hotel room. I stayed on the farm because we allowed three persons per bunkhouse for quarantine. Uh, it was 
It was just being isolated, being in the in the bunkhouse for 14 days. You can't come out. You're cordoned off with some flags around the around the bunkhouses. But we were able to just come out and get some fresh air. And it was still it was still like a mind game for me. And then okay, starting to work for the past couple of months. That's July. Like like four months or so into four, four or five months into the harvest. We had an outbreak on the farm. That messed with me a lot. Having to having the outbreak on the farm and then having your co other co-workers test positive. And then me, I tested negative. But the most stressful thing for me was getting the COVID test done. Having that Q-tip go into your nose. It was really, really stressful for me. But uh, it just, it was just, I just had to like, like wait it out. Wait out that, that, isolation and then after your test come back and then my my whole household that I was living in was negative and it made me feel really really happy but I was still sort of sad to hear that maybe three or four persons who I I would usually work with they tested they tested positive and then uh like um after something else that would would usually work on me like like what have me stressed out is just like uh, having to deal with being away from my kids in Trinidad and trying to, trying to still be a parent by helping them out with schoolwork, but online having to to talk about like to figure out what to do, uh, you know. It's just it was just really be, being being away and having to deal with COVID and having to deal with your family back home. It 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 really was really it's, it's still hard for me because. Yes, I'm still not too sure if what's happening back home in Trinidad. And I'm still not too sure what's happening here in Canada for migrant farm workers. We're not too sure if we're going to get vaccinated. So I still have to deal with, with, with COVID and the restrictions and still trying to isolate myself from, from co-workers wearing, that, wearing a mask and all that. And the most worrying thing is just, just wondering if I'll be able to, to get vaccinated. And and that's 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 just it for me. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your experiences, Belina. Um, and if folks, if you have any questions, um, we have one more speaker, but you can start to put your questions in the chat, um, especially for Felina as she needs to leave um, a bit earlier. So I will introduce our next speaker. It is my pleasure to introduce our last speaker, Jazer Montalano. Jazer is a registered nurse. He did his training in the Philippines and came to Canada as an international student. He is currently studying at Lambton College where he is enrolled in the Advanced Healthcare Leadership Program, which integrates care theories into current practices that are responsive to a variety of cultures, behaviors, situations, and environments. In the program, core concepts of leadership quality and improvements to patient safety are explored are explored to achieve enhanced patient outcomes. In addition to being a student, Jazzer is a frontline worker, currently providing care as a personal support worker at a long-term care home in Scarborough. He is also one of the members of staff that responds to staff shortages for other long-term care homes. Thank you for joining us today, Jazzer. Hello, hi everyone, I'm Jazzer. Uh, I am an international student and as we all know, we are currently doing online courses that makes working while going to school doable and possible. We are already doing it for two semesters. We can say that we are already adjusted to it. I hope my experience will contribute something to our webinar today. Yeah, as a responsible student before coming to Canada, we should have to think mainly of these things, namely our study, our living cost, accommodations, and our potential expenses. But sadly, the COVID pandemic devastated it all. Like the amount of stress greatly affects my mental health. Feeling anxious about everything was growing every day. And day after day in a foreign country, optimal spending is necessary. Eventually my reserve resources were depleting and I was in crisis. The only option I had was to find any kind of job for me to sustain. Gas jobs from cleaning works, line works, food manufacturing, assembling, 
Printing Works, and many others. I tried them all. <laughs> and I, re I remember how hard it was for me for an, as an international student when everybody was looking for jobs too. Everything is on lockdown, everything's closed. And with this kind of jobs, what's bothering me was people saying that it was illegal, it has to be declared and should be taxed. So I stopped immediately. So the thought of me doing illegal things in a foreign country wears me from inside and out. Fears and anxiety are on me. My immigration status as a student with work restrictions made my mental health vulnerable to stress. Then I said to myself, as if I have a choice, all I did was for my survival. I'm a health professional way back home in the Philippines, and I'm very much willing to share my skills and contribute to healthcare. From a Facebook post, a friendship was formed and I was referred and connected to Mom Connie here from Kairos. She said, if I'm willing to work in a long-term care facility, I said, yes. She added, it's a long-term care with a COVID outbreak. I still said, yes, it's an opportunity for me to help and practice my skills. The nursing home was in dire need of staff and I was interviewed by 10 a.m. that day and asked to report at 10 p.m. that same day. Just imagine how the daily need of manpower. It was crazy. Two died on my first day. My first day was a 16 hour shift because no PSW willing to report anymore. The work demands all of me, be it physically, spiritually, and emotionally. After, uh, and not to mention the social discrimination every time I declared that I'm working in a nursing home. While working and seeing someone die at my side, my fears started to grow. What if I will get infected too? Is can does Canada has something for me? Do I have safety benefits? That's my question. That's the questions uh, bothering every day for me. Unfortunately, after two weeks with all the precautions and PPEs, I get infected too. Sad. My fear was put on the surface. It's, uh, it's one of my unforgettable moments when the public health called me to just say, to stay in my room for two weeks. Just imagine, I'm new in Canada, no friends, no relatives, and no information about the services support from somewhere else. I think this is like from Stephanie said earlier, the lack of connectedness, the lack of connections. This is it. The worst was the fear of death in a foreign country where I was not even on their insured list. It was a nightmare. Fortunately, it happened with minimal symptoms. My family forbids me to work again, but the long-term care also needs me more. I see it positively. That there are no more suitable workers than us who survive the virus and get immunity from it. So I stay. So, I believe that international students contribute a fair share to Canada's economy, but sadly, we are exempted from the government's relief program. Canadians in this time of the pandemic are naturally caring and thoughtful and highly appreciated for the past response to those who are vulnerable. I, as one of the many international students serving the Canadians, hope that the system should detect us too as part of the vulnerables. Also, in behalf of all migrant workers, uh, those without status and the, under, and the undocumented, I hope that in this pandemic, the light of cooperation and collaboration will shine more. We hope that the access to the social service benefits and benefits should be for all, may it be Canadians or migrant workers, since COVID respects no labor. I am thankful to the groups like Kairos that lend their ears to us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jazzer. Thank you for sharing your experience. And also thank you to all of our speakers who came to share their experience and their research today. Um, we're gonna move into the question and answer period now. So you can write your questions in the chat. You can use the raise hand feature or unmute yourself and ask a question from our panel as well. Uh, Connie, was there something? Yes, go ahead, Connie. <laughs> Yes. Um, first of all, really, thank you so much, Felina and Jasser, for uh, for taking the risk of sharing your stories. 
and and you know further enlightening us on the real impact of mental health during pandemic um we you know we at kairos and everyone here uh, at this webinar you know recognizes and wanted and will always be there to to be able to provide support and services but it's only listening and hearing your stories that make this so real you know for us to us in order, you know, for many others to take action as well. Um, I, before we go on, you know, uh, opening the floor for a question and answer, I also would like to recognize uh, Tracy, Tracy Glynn. Uh, she's with us. Uh, Tracy is from uh, New Brunswick and involved in, in this, you know, uh, project on health. Uh, for migrant workers in the Maritimes. Uh, Tracy, I would like you to invite you to just, you know, uh, say briefly about the research work that, you know, you and the friends in the Maritimes are doing and how this is contributing to the overall conversation that we're having today. Okay, thank you so much, Connie. I'm going to be really um, quick. So um, I just, first of all, I want to thank um, all the panelists and Kairos and Stephanie for this very informative and important panel. Uh, like Connie said, I'm part of a research team based at Dalhousie University and St. Thomas University in partnership with Kairos, the Filipino Community Organization of New Brunswick, uh, the Cooper Institute and PEI and UFCW um, that is looking at the health and safety of temporary foreign workers in the Maritimes. Uh, so our team is collecting data from interviews with temporary foreign workers. Uh, our preliminary findings um, drawn from interviews mostly with participants in PEI but also New Brunswick show that um, COVID protective measures are being consistently in, sorry, inconsistently applied um, for temporary foreign workers. Um, as Alicio mentioned in his presentation, um, with COVID, migrant workers are still experiencing overcrowding and inadequate housing conditions, and that's something that's been coming up, uh, yeah, in our in our research with the PI temporary foreign workers. Um, so many workers have also told us about uh, precarious occupational conditions, and some have experienced illegal recruitment and employment practices, where much of the costs of employment are also being put on the workers. Um, so what we're finding, uh, as we expected, is that uh, profits are trumping concerns about worker health and safety during COVID and that the pandemic unfortunately did not change um, what was also the, the case before. Um, and also what we're noticing too in, in the, I'm, I'm based in Fredericton in um, New Brunswick, is that the, the media and public discourse on temporary foreign workers and COVID is, uh, is focused on how bans or potential bans on temporary farm workers could affect local food supplies and farmers and missing or what's not the center of the stories or discourse are the migrant workers who are laboring on our farms or food processing plants. Um, uh, so I'll put in the chat room, I'll put the website to our, our research project and thank you uh, again to Connie for giving me the space to, to talk about our research. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so that will be in the chat. Um, now we can open up our question and answer period. I see that we've already had a few questions in the chat, so I'll begin with those. But once more, you can write in the chat your question. Um, you can go under reactions and there's a raise hand uh, feature and I'll be able to see that you have your hand raised and call upon you. Um, but feel free to engage however works for you. Um, so there is one question. It says, on regards to the vaccination, are the workers stressed out for being or not being vaccinated? I believe that Felina touched on that a little bit um, in her portion, but maybe Jazza or even Felina, if you had something else to add to that. Hello? Yes, go ahead, Felina. Um, workers are stressed out. Uh, is we wondering, a bunch of us wondering if we're going to be vaccinated because Trinidad, because Trinidadian workers were stuck here all of last year and a lot of uh, persons weren't able to fly home mm -hmm. because the borders were closed at the end of last year when the season was over. So we're here and we, we, they, we got renewed work permits and 
the next question that just is just laying in everybody's mind is if we're going to be vaccinated or is it that we're going to be left with all the vaccination? Yes, thank you for sharing that. So we had another question. Um, this one is for Eliseo. It says, in regards to what Eliseo was saying about how stressful it is for the workers not to know if they will be paid, um, if they had to do a second quarantine, or if they will have to be sent to their country if they get sick. Could you please clarify what would happen in those cases? Are they getting paid if they had to quarantine? Or are they sent back home? So workers um, upon their post-arrival quarantine are paid quarantine pay. Um, that is clearly laid out as a preventative or a, a protocol measure um, for newly arrived workers. If workers are, so there's, there's two different ways in which a worker might be affected by COVID directly after that. And one would be to contract COVID themselves, which then would require not only a period of isolation, but also a period of recovery in which case in, in Ontario, that would be a workers' compensation claim. Um, and there have been some efforts made through the WSIB here to address those in an expedited way for employers to process those kinds of situations quickly. If a worker is impacted by an outbreak on the farm, but not personally ill, that's where Canada's CRSB is accessible to workers to cover a 14-day period of isolation. Um, that the process by which one might apply for that in terms of its accessibility would be various by varied by region um, and by farm and by uh, you know technology and, and, and connectivity and supports um, certainly repatriation uh, is always a concern um, but I would say a sick worker who is sick with COVID who tested positive would not be sent home immediately there would definitely be um, public health protocols in place, but that does not guarantee that after a worker is recovering from COVID that they may not be sent home if they're not able to integrate back into work. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Alicia. Yes. Uh, something that I would like to mention too is that what I understood last year, and I, I have to be honest with you, the information sometimes is very clear and sometimes it's clear, but you don't know if that information is real. So they have these for the quarantine, the federal government provided money for the farmers to pay for the, to cover quarantine time. And so within this, it was the income for the workers. That was not the total number of hours multiplied by the basic salary, but it was less than that. But also when they go into quarantine, many cases, the workers get the adoption for their uh, full. And so then the, the money that they get when they are in quarantine can be quite low and not to cover too much expenses or even to assist with the family where they are from. So theoretically, they should be covered, but in practice, the level of coverage, economic, financial coverage that they have is can, can be quite limited. In regard to the fear to be uh, deported, well, no, it's not really deported, sent back to, I think that here the reality sometimes is kind of, uh, has some strange sense of humor. In practice, I'm not talking about what is legal. In practice, the farmer has all the power to send the worker to home. What those, what doesn't let happen, doesn't let him to, or her to do it, is because now all the countries are aware of the COVID-19. And it's not just an issue to take the flight ticket, go to the plane and fly, because there is all this COVID restriction. And so in normal circumstances, average circumstances, the worker will be sent back to the country. But now they can't, because this condition and this, uh, all these regulations that are now in place. So in a way, it, it works to protect the worker. Maybe not with that intention, but the final result is protect the workers to free, to be sent to the home country. And so the worker stays. Thank you, Eliseo. Um, and I see that Anna Yancey 
has their hand raised. So Anna, if you'd like to ask your question. Oh, hi. I just want to introduce myself. My name is Anna and I work for uh, Options, uh, BC, uh, Community Services in BC. And I, like, uh, I would like to say thank you to Stephanie and Martel for the presentation. And I can tell you about the experience. Like, I am working with a few farms helping uh, DFWs and they were like uh, quarantined during Christmas time. And you know, like Christmas and New Year Eve, no? And we were able to bring dinners to their, what they were doing in the quarantine at the hotels, no? And that's, that's something that's a little bit helped them to be a little bit like happy because it was Christmas Eve and New Year and being quarantined away from the family and in a room by their, by, um, by their own, no? And something that affect them really mentally. And I like the presentation that Stephanie was talking and Martel about what they left behind, no? Because they come here to work, but they left their family. And during the quarantine, like many, like I can see like is the, the farmers don't let them go out. They want them to be in this, like maybe safe house. I, I don't know how they call it, but they don't let them to go shopping. They make arrangements from some people to bring their, grocery to the where they're living and that is increasing the mental health because they are being isolated and that is like yeah it's as, as martel said that they cannot send them back because there is no flight there's no way to go back right now no there is no from here like from bc normally they go through mexico and there is no flight to mexico now they have to go all the way to toronto and then toronto panama and then Guatemala, no? And that's expensive for them to send them back. Uh, and something that I would like to uh, pay more attention is like, sometimes they, they don't express how they're feeling because they are scared, no? But I had an issue yesterday and the worker told me that her mom went to uh, surgery like a few days ago and she's sick. And I was asking him, do you wanna go and visit her? And then he asked me like, no, I cannot do that because and the one supporting her economically, no? Like if he stopped working, then her, his mom won't have the medication that she requires right now, no? And sometimes we don't pay attention to what's going on with them because they are here working, but they have family back home that is going through illness or other situation, no? And that is affecting them to, the same way that affect us, even though we are here, like if there is problem at home, we don't work the same as we normally do, no? And that's something that we has to maybe uh, create more, uh, I don't know, maybe, I don't know, through uh, virtual meeting, helping them, or more like having someone that can talk and about anxiety, how to cope the, with all those mental illness that they can might be going through, no? Because it's not easy for them just to come here and work from, long hours, like maybe 12 hours a day, and they just go home to sleep. And then the next day they have to be working again and no one is paying attention to what they're going through. And I think that's, it. that's why I like this. Uh, thank you for doing this. Pro this, uh, this is stage teaching us you know, how to work with the TFW, how to work with people who are here, you know, because sometimes we don't pay attention to those what they need no and this is like i don't know for me is 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 a very good presentation that i might be able to to put in practice no when i'm supporting the tfw i didn't have a question just want to say thank you okay thank you anna um so i'm going to go back to the chat as we have a, some other comments and questions in there um, so Jane Andres said, I'd like to add that increased surveillance and security cameras at bunk houses has greatly added to the stress levels. And then there's another comment from Donna Brown that says, from my conversations, many workers are stressed about the vaccine because of myths and distrust. Uh, and we have a question actually about the vaccine, which is, do you know when they will be vaccinated in Ontario? And they, I, in this case, I assume refers to temporary migrant workers. Um, 
In terms of vaccination scheduling for Ontario, I know they're on a priority list as essential workers, um, but I don't know the timelines according to the province's rollout. I do know in BC, some farms and some groups of workers have already been vaccinated. Um, and I know that the Mexican government is, is looking to continue that in BC, but in Ontario, um, yeah, I'm not quite sure yet, but they're on the list. They started yesterday. Thanks, Jane. <laughs> Um, yes, one large farm was vaccinated yesterday. A lot of anxiety and texts and requests for prayer coming in all day yesterday because the guys were very scared. Um, their employer was good. He said that he would that they had a choice, and so they talked together and they decided that they would. Um, and the employer also said that as soon as it's available, he'll be. Um, him and his family will be getting vaccinations as well. But what some of them have expressed is they believe that um, they've got a whole different set of risks for getting vaccinated that we do as Canadians. So when I told them um, that my 92 year old mother got it and there's no side effects, they said, yes, but she's white and she doesn't have diabetes or a high blood pressure. She doesn't have to worry about sickle cell anemia. She doesn't have to worry about asthma. These are all things we're worried about. And another very high stress level, I might just add as well, in some of the hotels, the diets are very, very bad. We're talking about French fries with a bag of chips for lunch. This is at the Ramada in Niagara Falls. For people with high blood pressure and diabetes, it's so dangerous, but there's nowhere to um, appeal to. They said it's the employer and public health that are in charge of determining their diets there, but it's, but nobody is responsible. So that's also a huge stressor for people in quarantine that they're putting themselves at risk just by having to rely on such poor diets and no ability to open a window or move. Um, so that's a bit of an aside from the vaccinations, but there are those additional concerns about the vaccinations that they don't know how safe they are um, in light of their own personal health histories and their um, relationship with Canadian health systems here. They've been lied to a lot in clinics in our area or particular doctors. So they really have difficulty trusting. They're worried if they get side effects from this, will they be sent home? So, um, and lose their jobs. So that's what's happening in Niagara that way. But the vaccinations have started somehow. Thank you very much for that information, Jane. And, and I just think what Jane raised is a very, very important point um, for workers from the Caribbean. Um, their, you know, their own personal life histories, the history of, you know, the way um, certain populations have been targeted by medical officials in the development of certain vaccines over the course of history is never forgotten by uh, workers from the Caribbean. And so when we talk about providing vaccinations to worker, we need, workers, we need to provide them with all of the information that they need that is culturally sensitive and provides them with the opportunity to make a, an informed choice. And one thing that we're just, you know, while we're on this topic, because vaccine hesitancy is something that exists in this population, we don't want to see any employers um, making choices about which workers to retain or recall based on their own individual willingness to be vaccinated. And I think that's something that has some mental health concerns for workers, most certainly in terms of, are they able to make a choice? And in making that choice, what are they risking? And is it a trade-off? And so these are just, this year's mental health concerns are very much tied to vaccines. And then also thinking about the vaccine being a two-shot vaccine and the vaccines that we have here may not be the vaccines that are in sending countries. And so some concerted effort has to be made to be sure that workers are able to, if they do start one vaccine, they have the second of the same vaccine. Mm -hmm. So there's a few concerns that we all have to think about in this transnational context um, and, and taking into account people's cultural conceptions of themselves uh, as well. Thanks, Jane. Can I add a line or two here to the conversation? Oh. Yes, go ahead. Okay, Gabriel is my name. Um, thanks for all those panelists, especially the workers. A um, couple of things, Jane just touched on them and I'm pretty sure that I've been um, the common thread. Um, somebody, um, Jane spoke about culturally appropriate food, access to that. 
and we know we know with the the virus uh, and with health and well being, keeping our immune system healthy is really really important. And what is the best way than to eat properly, right? And during quarantine, fourteen days of quarantine, um, uh, just to be dependent on somebody supplying you something which is totally different to what you're accustomed to. That is that is a really important point. I just want to repeat it for emphasis. Uh, that's powerful. Um, how do we work around that? Um, that is important. I'll tell you why. There, there's so many cases where the workers were coming in this year. For the first, well, as a result of last year, um, um, the, the, the farmers, the system is now trying to help the workers to access culturally appropriate food. That is important. That's huge. However, in some of the instances that I'm coming across, um, whereas the, the food is culturally appropriate, but the quantities is one, the quantities of food that have been provided to the workers is not sufficient to last in the 14 days, one, and the cost that they've been charged is really exorbitant. So the workers are not happy with the quantity to, to last in 14 days because during that time, they cannot go and access it, right? That is what they have and they have to make it do. And the, the, the charge, the cost attached to it is a headache to them. So that, that is one. Um, another issue is... Um, Power imbalance. There's so much power. We know that the whole there's a lot of fear in the program, right? There's a lot of power imbalance. Before COVID, the farmer usually most times would accompany the workers to access healthcare. With COVID, what what would happen? What is happening? The, the farm is still involved. So there's, there's that kind of um, uh, pressure pressure added to the worker, right? Because remember, the worker is tied. The workers are tied to the employer. And they have to please the employer, right? So, so there's a, a lot of pressure. So, where, where is the pressure? Um, the, the, there's high power imbalance, and that is a significant pressure on the worker. And that does not bring, um, that does not bring, um, that does not make the situation better for the workers. And th these are important things, um, you know, in getting healthcare accessible, healthcare in a manner that is easy, free, and 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 in the workers' best interest. That is my opinion. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriel. And I see, Eliseo, that you are unmuted. If you there's something you'd like to add, or yes, this is in regard to the vaccine. Something I won't be surprised that my understanding is that in BC is not mandatory. Now, in regard to the vaccine, I believe that we need to probably do more education about the vaccine in regard to myths and uh, beliefs about the vaccine to at least to prevent that workers make a decision based on limited information. They have the right to make a decision, but it has to be an informed decision. But if the information that you get is only the bad thing that can happen with the vaccine, then it's a misinformed decision. So we need to provide that. And just would like to mention something here, and I don't know if Eduardo is still with us, but he just circulated yesterday a set of uh, uh, fact sheets about the vaccine. And I had a chance to just browse one of them in English. And I got the impression that it probably has a good information for the workers and maybe it will be good to, to look at them. Maybe we can use that information for the workers because it's already there. So just uh, as a comment, no? Thank you. And I see that Eduardo does have his hand up. So Eduardo, if you'd like to go next. I'm sure. Yeah. Thank you so much. And this is an amazing event. Um, yeah, I, I had um, helped put together some vaccine information. Uh, I'll put them into the, the chat here um, to share them. So we worked a lot with um, a group in Toronto. It's a group of doctors that verified all the information and uh, a newcomer, a, a set of newcomer and refugee organizations that are also trying to get the key information out to newcomer communities in, in different languages. And there's actually a resource that they're developing that specifically talks about how this vaccine has been uh, tested around uh, um, uh, in terms of groups from different diverse uh, racial and ethnic backgrounds. So we're looking at maybe pulling that information to, to share, to show that, that it has been, to kind of help a little bit with, um, with that uh, confidence. But I'll put the, the resources in the chat um, but the last thing I was going to say, too, is that we've been really trying to push public health to ensure that there's a lot of time or 
you know, right way before vaccination is actually offered that they need to start communicating before, like, you know, um, advanced communication with workers. So workers feel that they're not pressured. They understand the process um, because if this is happening fast, you get to the concerns of, yeah, of, of having people, you know, feel, feel like they're rushed to make a decision. Um, so I think if anybody has contacts to public health units to echo that, and as, you know, as not even a best practice, just as something that they 100% should be doing, um, but, but yeah, I'll, I'll include the, the links here soon. I'm just having trouble with my, with my, um, uh, with the links, but I'll include them here and any feedback on those resources would be great. Uh, we, for example, because of everything that's happening with the AstraZeneca vaccine and the, um, concerns around that and, and the news coverage around blood clots, um, there was a lot of concern that there'd be a lot of worry about that vaccine and that vaccine might actually be the one offered because it's the one that moves, uh, is easier to transport. So um, the Toronto based group again is looking at developing a fact sheet in different languages, specifically talking about AstraZeneca to try to show, you know, that that there's still, uh, you know, evidence to look at ensuring that it's safe and and but to, to still provide people with with uh, all the evidence, right? So they can make a decision. So, and ultimately that it's their decision, no one can be forced, right? So, but yeah, I'll share that, but thank you so much. This is a great event. Thank you, Eduardo. And thank you for sharing those resources. I'm gonna go to Connie next. Um, Connie. Um, thank you, Jalen. Uh, I just wanted to check in with Felina. Uh, you mentioned that you're living at 2.30, 2.30. So I, yeah, uh, if you're still okay. and. Uh, if you have to leave soon, uh, we just wanted to say thank you, and we hope to see you again. Um, the um, the other thing is that there's a question uh, written on the chat if you know uh, if there is a need uh, to raise awareness, you know, among employers about mental health issues. Um, I was checking in the participants list and was about to invite Brett, you know, Schuler to uh, to chime in, but I think he left already. But yeah, that is something that you know we would like to look at in terms of uh, you know, uh, thus uh, would employer uh, employers need support or awareness around mental health. Um, um, maybe in you know uh, the future webinars, that's something that we can look at. Uh, Filena, are you still okay to join, or you have to go? I, I I've seen that you've moved your <laughs> camera or your computer outside. I'm gonna head back to work. I just want to say thank you to everybody for having me and have me sharing my experience here working in Canada, and. Thank you again, everybody. You're Thank welcome. You. Thank, Thank you, Lena. Yeah. Bye. Bye. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. So I'm going to be moving over to the chat as we have quite a few questions in there. Um, so one question from Susan James is, if we can only do one thing to advocate for some relief or improvement, what would be the most important thing, strategy, or service to push for? That's a short question with a huge amount of thinking <laughs> to one thing. Uh, I think in the context of COVID right now, the first thing that could be done, and it's easy to say, difficult to do, requires various efforts from various people, but public health or a health professional, like a health promoter through a community health center, uh, a health professional needs to be tasked in each community or province with monitoring the health and wellness of workers, giving workers a chance to articulate their concerns around health, broadly conceived, physical health, mental health, um, in an environment that is safe and with someone who is qualified um, to, uh, in the sense that they understand the specific issues migrant workers face, but also the precarity uh, of their situation here um, and the way that that precarity affects how they navigate health services, including mental health services. And so, I mean, and, and it's hard to separate mental health from physical health in this context, if not impossible. Um, and so in this case, I think, you know, somebody monitoring, a health professional monitoring the, the health and wellness of workers through the season would provide not just the physical reassurances that there was mechanisms in place if a worker becomes sick or has a question, and that that level of reassurance uh, as a first step would 
reduce some of the stress workers uh, feel and experience in relation to the precarity of their bodies during COVID. Um, but that would really be just a COVID stopgap because really a lot of these mental health issues are tied to huge systemic structural conditions um, that are embedded in the program and that have just sort of been exposed and made worse by COVID. So it's an ongoing dialogue, but I think right now this year we need someone to help care for workers. Go ahead, Alicia. I probably will follow what Stephanie was saying. There are individual and contextual elements. So the individual probably is through services that we can offer. And by this, what I mean is that mental health is a stigma, not only in those countries. It's also a stigma here in Canada. And that means that even for someone to acknowledge that he has a mental health issue will be a difficult challenge. So that means that then to, for the workers, but the first thing is that the workers probably need to learn more about themselves in regard that, yes, I'm going through this, it's more than stress, I have to do something about it. But that doesn't have any value if there is no something waiting for him or her to react. So she or he can then go to, talk to, look at, etc. So, and this is, even though it's kind of similar to the physical health, it's probably more challenging because the society, our society per se is also that way. So it's a parallel, your the size is different, but it's the same attitude. So that's one thing. The second one so is the contextual element. And something that we need to be clear here is that the COVID-19, the only thing that COVID-19 has done is to accentuate all the negatives and dysfunctional elements that the program has. And by this, I don't mean the farmer. It's the program. The program has even developed, I will say from a very colonialistic perspective. And, and something that the program does is that creates a, a total and even condition of control between the farmer and the worker. And so many farmers are okay with that and, do, and they don't abuse that situation. They are fair with the workers, they provide services, etc. So it's not the farmer per se, it's the, the nature of the program that allows those things to happen. And so when we talk about the contextual thing, we need to address the contextual things that are in that program. Because then that can uh, provide a deterrent to the abusive farmers to do it. And will support the farmers who don't. And, and that is something that we need to keep remembering. Because in one year, we hope, COVID-19 will be a sad memory, but the workers are still coming to Canada to that in, within that program. And if those conditions doesn't change, we are going to go back to the same situation, just minimal for us, maximal for the workers. So that is something that if everything that we do is able to create that conscious and then that the purpose of keep working on this, I think that, that that will be good enough. And I, I will also uh, support Stephanie that to have a, a, an immediate response to the workers, it can be quite challenging, to be honest. Sometimes I even working in the clinic, et cetera, feel, feel a little like, a, I don't know, not, not very motivated because there are so many things that we need to change, but we need to keep doing it. Thank you, Eliseo. I see, Connie, that you have your hand up. Um, thank you very much, Eliseo and Stephanie, for your you know, uh, responses, input, and thoughts. And Susan, as you can probably you know, uh, see, there is no short answer to, <laughs> to your question. And you know, this has been what uh, migrant support organizations and advocates had been kind of working, you know, working on throughout the years, uh, looking at 
uh, the policies, the program, and the the systemic, you know, problems embedded uh, on it. But I would like to 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 start though with saying that you know the current support, uh, the current uh, funding that we receive from. Uh, the government to support temporary foreign workers during COVID-19 is a step, is a positive step in terms of being able to mobilize, you know, and support community organizations and support groups that are already providing support to uh, migrant workers, have built relationships with them over the years. So the infusion of this, you know, funding enables, you know, community groups and partners to be able to do more work. And and um, and I know that we community partners are very committed, you know, doing this underground with or without funding, and and this also provides visibility to to the work that is being done on the ground. Unfortunately, though, we only have until June thirtieth, you know. Uh, to to continue this type of you know work and support and funding from the government and as we have already experienced or seeing on the ground and the fact that we're having these webinars you know and workers are also community partners are also rolling out information sessions and workshops directed to uh, migrant workers and providing you know. Um, Welcome, welcome bags, and so forth is is again a, a good uh, a good start, a good step up forward. But we need more. We need you know more of this, more uh, support, more participation from the general public, the community, uh, to let this information out, to get ourselves you know aware of what's happening uh, with uh, the workers who come here to make sure that we have food on the table, we have uh, care workers working in long-term care facilities, looking after children and our children are, are elderly. And, and so um, this is what we're, we're, we're hoping to achieve in a short period of time, uh, provide the information, mobilize more support, and hopefully, you know, uh, more changes, more positive changes would happen as far as policy, uh, government policies are concerned. So yes, let's let's keep this going and let's keep the conversation going and, you know, uh, the collaboration and working together. Thank you, Connie. Uh, the next question that we have in the chat is, is there a standard amount of farmers are required to pay workers while in quarantine? We have to realize that while workers are in quarantine, they're still supporting their families. Secondly, no provision was made for them to remit money while in quarantine in the event of an emergency. So gratefully, the Kairos project has um, allowed the people on the ground that and some of us in community groups and certain organizations to distribute this information through webinars and information sessions and workshops to workers. Um, so Service Canada and, and the Government of Canada has clarified that in post arrival quarantine workers must be paid a minimum of the 30 hours per week at the regular hourly rate of pay. The payment for this time period is not an advance and cannot be reaped back by the employer. Um, this is, is quarantine pay. If you're a seasonal worker, this pay is not part of the guaranteed 240 hours. It is on top of your minimum 240 hours. Um, so just to, that's the government information right there. And I wonder, do I have something after that? Okay, so quarantine pay. Employers can make regular deductions um, notably workers in quarantine are responsible for the cost of their food. So although employers are helping with that and some, some regions have others helping with that as well, um, if the employer is providing the food, uh, it, it can be deducted from, um, from the pay. And so that's, those are the information on quarantine pay for right now. Um, notably, any workers on quarantine cannot be asked to do administrative tasks. So if say they were employed on a farm in a capacity as a laborer, and now they're in quarantine, they can't be asked to start working, you know, doing administrative tasks, they are not to work while in quarantine. 
Thank you for sharing that, Stephanie. Um, the next question that we had, I think, is a two-parter. I'll read the whole thing off and then can answer the questions one by one. So the next question was, what about the workers who have been laid off because of COVID, which have resulted in a worker's permanent residency application being rejected and the plans for family reunification being delayed? I'm aware of one worker in this situation. The situation has caused her emotional distress. Should more direct pathways for a permanent residency be added to the list of recommendations? The worker I know was hoping that Trudeau would have compassion and approve the permanent residency applications for workers laid off due to COVID. Um, so I can repeat the first question, which is about the workers who are, have been laid off due to COVID, and this has resulted in uh, a rejection or a delay in uh, family reunification and permanent residency applications. So in terms of pathways to permanent residency, um, I think that, you know, most certainly, we should be at the level of the government considering ways to increase individual security um, and people's rights and abilities to move and, and settle their families where they need to work. Um, and I think that, you know, there has been a lot of debate about uh, permanent residency and does it undermine the context and the purpose of this program. And so a few things that should be noted, I mean, workers should have the option and recognizing that not all workers will choose to settle their families here. Um, but having the ability to move your family back and forth and along the patterns of family need when there's births and deaths and to have these kinds of um, rights the way and labor protections the way that um, a Canadian would in the same context. Uh, I think that's really important. And I think developing pathways to permanent residency that are more accessible and that recognize not just the long standing contribution that many individuals make over their you know, lives working here for decades on end, but the ways that those individuals imbue communities um, here with not just economic resources, they're spending the money oftentimes that they, they make here to think, purchase things and send back home, but to recognize people as whole persons with families um, and to not ask workers to make such an incredible trade-off in their own family lives in order that we here might feed our families with less distress or concern. So yes, I'm hugely supportive of new and increased access to existing pathways to permanent residency. Alicia or Connie, I'm not sure if you wanted to also add on to that. Oh, Connie, yeah. go ahead. Yeah. Uh, Tracy, I'm wondering if you know, uh, you can ask uh, the person who, who's affected, uh, you know, who was laid off and her, their, his permanent, her or his permanent residency application has been rejected. Uh, we can, if you can share that, we can appeal it. We don't want to see another worker committing suicide just because, you know, uh, the, the application for permanent residency or the impacts of COVID on the person's mental health is so enormous that the person cannot cope it. Um, I'm referring to uh, uh, a migrant caregiver who committed suicide in Alberta uh, early this year because of, you know, uh, the, the refusal or, or the very long processing and the uncertainty of becoming a permanent resident, resident and being reunited with, you know, with her, with her family. So we want to emphasize, we don't want to see any more, you know, uh, unnecessary deaths like that. Can I add to this conversation? Yes, of course. Earlier, um, we heard from the Trini worker, sorry that she had to leave early. Um, we heard about um, her difficulty in helping her daughter, her children with assignments, right? Um, I'm from the Caribbean and all descendants of migrant workers or migrants would know that that common thing in the Caribbean, we call it brain drain. And in the case of migrant workers, we call it the barrel baby, where we rely on remittances and, and gifts that are sent to us, right? Can you imagine the likely trouble? And I'm pretty sure that's the purpose of that webinar, to create hope, right? And whether it's fear, the, what is life with fear? And what is life with hope? And that's the purpose of the webinar, to create hope. And that's why I want to really um, give really um, kudos to Kairos, 
because the, the migrant workers, the vulnerable people in Canada, they impacted yet still, they impacted, but yet still, they're not, um, their, their issues are not being addressed or, or listened to. And that's what Kairos is doing. The, the fact that they have um, workers on this panel right now, that is telling you that, you know, that, that, is, that is a program, that is an organization that is geared towards bringing hope to people. In going back to the issue of the, the trainee worker, her difficulty of helping her children with a cyber bag home. How do you do that? Is there software to do that? How do you do that? And she herself is in a difficult situation. Can you imagine her situation? That is kind of similar to the same Trinidadians. Okay, being a migrant worker, we could not access EI. We cannot access EI in Canada. Here we have, big, you heard from the Trinidadian a while ago, because um, after the contract ended, the borders were closed, they couldn't go home. So a lot of Trinidadians were stranded in Canada. Eh? The migrants and workers are telling Canada, you tell me when I go home, I cannot access EI. Here am I in Canada, I, want, I need to access EI. You know what Canada said? Oh, you need to have a, a work permit, blah, 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 blah. You, they keep on changing the rules and make it difficult, difficult, difficult eventually the, the workers were able to access the AI because of pressure, because of pressure of organizers on the ground. And the same thing with the issue um, um, Connie just mentioned of a case of suicide, because there's no hope, there's so much fear built. And it's because of man-made rules, man-made rules. And it's, it's only because of pressure, because of pressure that will cause the government to, to change. And that is why, what I'm hoping to come out there, to bring hope into, into the program, to bring hope to people who are vulnerable and precarious, right? And how, how can we do that? We can do that in so many ways, but ultimately it's not just laws, not just policies of the politician. That is what we need to change. And so we have to think of creative ways to change to push the hands of the politicians because what they're saying that's not an issue in my riding because we cannot vote right migrant workers cannot vote so who'd listen to us it's you the, the, the citizens it's you the consumer that can push the politicians so i'm hoping that will come out of this session thanks thank you gabriel go ahead connie yeah thank you thank you very much you know uh gabriel those are the kind of you know uh words, inspiration, and prodding that, you know, we need to hear more. Um, I just wanted to, I was hoping that Felina would share this during her, you know, uh, sharing, but I just wanted to share some good news. Uh, Felina has applied for permanent residency with the support of her employer, and she is the first one actually apparently who has applied, you know, uh, permanent residency under the program. So we're all kind of watching, you know, what would happen and how positive the outcome would be, because then this would, you know, inspire and encourage more workers and hopefully more employers too to support uh, their workers to, to become permanent residents. So when I was talking to Felina to invite her to this conversation and share her story. And of course, I asked her about the risk that she might, you know, she might be facing in coming out public and sharing, you know, uh, her story. And, and that's when she, you know, she told me that she is actually being processed, like her application is underway uh, to becoming permanent resident. So that is very, you know, good news. And we're all happy for her. There is a farmer who does support permanent status, um, just in case anybody's interested. And it's uh, Fenning Organic Farm in uh, New Hamburg. Jennifer Fenning is also a town councillor, and she's been a very um, vocal advocate in supporting permanent residency. So if anybody lives in that area, go buy from that farm. And um, yes, it's uh, she's had some very good radio interviews, and we need to just keep pushing the words of a farmer out there too, so that it will kind of break the ice. And um, I know a number of wineries are interested in having permanent workers. There are a number of them in process here. One farm worker, I just talked to him last night, it's been four, 000, four years and $30,000 later and he still hasn't heard. It's a very frightening journey to be on. So um, yeah. I mean, he could face the fact that he's being denied after all of this. And he's absolutely crucial on his farm. So, yeah, it's a tough, tough journey to be on. Um, can I add a little line here? Um, Fenin's Organic Farm 
the member of NFU, National Farmers Union. And generally, NFU, they believe in fairness, fair trade, treating the soil fairly, treating the environment fairly, treating the workers fairly. They, they, they support and endorse um, status upon arrival for migrant workers. So that is, um, NFU is, is really aligned and very supportive of that movement. Um, in terms of, of Fenice Organic Farm, they too, they bring in migrant workers from Jamaica. I would be happy to know that this farm have, um, they also would, um, I would be happy for the day when I would have success stories that their workers too have applied and are successful as permanent residents. And um, the issue of permanent residents, I need to spell out. Being a permanent resident, being um, having PR, having status in Canada to a migrant worker, that does not mean living in Canada to us. What it means, it is that tool, not having status, first of all, not having status in Canada means that you denied basic human rights and you denied basic labor standards. And that is what um, COVID is highlighting, right? The vulnerabilities. That's what it's exposing. Somebody said it so nicely. COVID has exposed Canada's dirty secret. That's what COVID has done, right? So not having status is really what is exposing. And you can see all those, the, most of the people in the front line, these are the people, these are the vulnerable people and they are without status, people of color, blah, 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 blah. So I'll be happy um, to, to tell you, this is that tool, that thing that would help us to access decent work. But first of all, um, let me put it this way. Not having status, um, being a migrant worker, we have a tied work permit. We are tied to our employer, tied to employer. And so we are the employer's mercy. We have to please our employer. But if you have an open work permit, the pressure is now on our employer to create the conditions that would attract us and that would keep us. But right now, being tied to employer, what happens? Where's the pressure? The pressure is on the worker. And we do not, simply because we do not have status. And these are just human-made stuff, as we said, and this can be changed. And how do we bring fairness? Fairness, fairness is, uh, a migrant worker can access fairness by having status. Generally, by having status, it, gives, it is that little power that you have that will put the pressure on the employee. There's high power imbalance. So status upon arrival is that one thing that will help us to take care of most of our vulnerabilities in Canada. And what are the vulnerabilities? Both labor and human rights vulnerabilities. Thanks. Thank you so much, Gabriel, for highlighting just the importance that status plays. I note, I'm taking in the note of the time. It's three o'clock now, a little bit after. Um, so I'd like to invite our speakers and Connie, if there's any final words that you'd like to say to wrap up and then I'm going to go to David to um, talk about our next webinar. I just want to thank you all, uh, Jalen and Connie and everyone at Kairos, uh, for inviting me here to share my research and some of the things we're hearing about on the ground this year. Um, and just to echo Connie's point, this uh, Kairos project is a step in the right direction in the sense that it uh, sought to imbue those of us and, and groups that are on the ground already to continue and expand their efforts. Um, and I really see community support groups as playing a big role in alleviating some of the stress and pressures at the individual level that workers uh, are experiencing. So. Thank you for this opportunity today and for all the wonderful questions and to my um, co-panelists, uh, Eliseo and, uh, and Felina and Jazzer, thank you very much. Have a great day. Thank you, Stephanie. Go ahead, Eliseo. Yes, I would like to say thank you for to Kairos for the opportunity to, to implement this, uh, well, the opportunity given to me to participate in this uh, webinar. That he, it really addressing a very important topic. Sometimes I believe that mental health is the big elephant. In the, room. the only thing that the room is the whole society. So the elephant is very, very big. And this presentation to me, more than trying to tell people what to do, how to think, is more an invitation to all of us to learn more about mental health. And how can we in our own settings help to address this situation in our own, with our own environment, but also in our work with the migrant workers who also are in big need of support in that area. So thank you, Kairos, and thank you, Connie, and thank you, Jalen, for uh, keeping us on control. And I'm showing the slides that we wanted, uh, we wanted you to show, so thanks a lot. And thank you to everybody for being here. I, we, I really appreciate that.
Thank you again. Thank you, Elisa. Connie, did you want to say a few words? I think Jasser is still with us. Uh, Jasser, a few words? Or... Yes, also, it's also my pleasure that I was invited to speak. And thank you, everyone. Yeah, the webinar is very useful for me. Thank you. Thank you, Jasser. Uh, so my yeah, our, our 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 biggest thanks to our speakers Stephanie, Eliseo, Jasser, and Felina, and you know for the Kairos team who put this uh, webinars together, Jalen, Alfredo, David, and Shannon, and with us as well as Ed, and to everyone, thank you, thank you so much for you know for for joining and we'd love to see you you know in 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 the coming few uh webinars and david you have something to introduce the next webinar <laughs> hello um yes so the web uh, the next webinar is going to be on tuesday april 6th easter tuesday um and the topic is going to be on uh freedom of movement um so the ability to uh, after the quarantine period, uh, leave the farm uh, or uh, space that they're working in um, and how to maneuver that safely, but also ensuring that uh, the workers have the ability to uh, have that freedom to take time off of the space in which they're working uh, and also hope to touch on the new regulations or protocols that have been put in place from Canada and how that relates to travel and movement as well. Uh, and a short plug for the April 23rd webinar, which is going to be on uh, actions that interested people can take to support uh, migrant workers. Um, so we've been talking a lot about the great work that organizations have done, but sometimes people, uh, individual people may not necessarily know what they can do, uh, even sitting from home or uh, if they want to uh, volunteer. So looking into the ways that uh, interested people can uh, help support migrant workers. So yes, uh, the registration link for the April 6th webinar is in the chat again. Uh, and I look forward to seeing all y'all there. Thank you, David. And again, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, we look forward to seeing you in our next webinars.